Yes, dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to be interviewing uh, and uh, discussing the data with uh, Professor Matthew Smith on uh, non-metastatic CRPC. We've had uh, three approvals on um, the indication non-metastatic CRPC. And just recently, last weekend at the virtual ASCO GU meeting, three interesting abstracts on this topic we would like to discuss with you. The first one I found very interesting goes into the evaluation of molecular determinants. Um, if they might be associated with a long-term response to apalutamide in non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. So, um, Professor Smith, you were one of the co-authors and uh, also led this trial. Could you allude a little bit on uh, what you found out, what was uh, heavily discussed also on, on social media after presentation from uh, Dr. Feng, I think, and it was a very interesting topic and uh, surely understood the discussion. Sure, I'm happy to do so. So in the, the overarching goal of this project was to better understand the molecular determinants of response and resistance within, the, within Spartan. So these are patients treated with apalutamide or placebo. Um, and we classified patients as either long-term responders or early progressors that just corresponded to the best and worst quartiles of um, metastasis-free survival. And then gene expression profiles were done in the, with patients with available um, archival primary tumors. Um, and the data was really quite interesting. Um, so the, among patients with long-term response on epilutamide, um, there the three signatures, uh, three categories of signatures emerged as being associated with long-term response. They were increased immune regulation, um, including um, T, greater T cell activation, stimulation or cytokine response, as well as interferon production dec and decreased T cell exclusion. Uh, the second signature was the low um, proliferation, low proliferative capacity. And then as you might expect, uh, the third category was increased hormone dependence. Um, the predictors of resistance, the converse, those being associated with the patients who were early progressors, were a high decipher score, hormone non-responsiveness, low androgen receptor activity, and neuroendocrine-like tumors. Um, so really compelling dichotomization of molecular signatures between the two groups. Um, and I think could be this approach could be used to identify patients most likely to benefit from apalutamide, as well as potentially address an area of unmet need, meaning those patients least likely to benefit from intervention. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I've learned from also from recent published data that all patients with non-metastatic CRPC uh, having a short PSA doubling time less than 10 months benefit from apalutamide treatment out of Spartan trial. Out of your published results now, would you exclude a cohort? Or would this just uh, support the use in those early progressors? Can, can some clinical value out of this presentation uh, be summarized? Or how would, you, how would you summarize these findings? Sure, so I, th I, don't, I don't think we're at a place where we would yet use that to either in select or exclude patients from treatment with apalutamide or one of the other approved drugs for that matter. But it could be a path forward for future clinical trials. So in particular, the patients least likely to benefit, really. In many ways, you might say we have this disease state covered. We have three approved drugs that are highly effective. But with this work, we've been able to identify at least a cohort of early progressors who might benefit from novel uh, intervention. And so that could conceivably be a path forward to inform design of future clinical trials where you'd be either looking at um, an alternative approach uh, to one of the, the approved therapies or potentially an add-on approach to increase time to metastasis and potentially even improve survival. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. And I think those early progressors might be the ones that you would have ca caught with PSMA imaging as to be metastatic CRPC probably, which uh, then would lead into more intensified treatment probably since we are not talking about MHSPC anymore or no, not uh, M0 CRPC once it comes to those heavy progressing patients where you would probably expect some metastasis 
in PSMA. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot on this uh, abstract. So there were a couple other abstracts uh, presented uh, about non-metastatic CRPC at uh, ASCO GU. The, and the, the other one that I thought was worth discussing was this network meta-analysis that was looking to compare the efficacy of enzalutamide with other agents, the two approved drugs, apalutamide and darolutamide, uh, as well as bicalutamide. Um, and this analysis uh, was a network meta-analysis using the published data from Spos Prosper, Aramis, uh, and Spartan, three of the, the three pivotal studies, as well as STRIVE, which is, as you know, is a comparison of enzalutamide versus bicalutamide. Um, and so what, what were your thoughts about this? Well, um, um, interesting approach. Um, since we don't have direct head-to-head -head comparison, this is basically the best we can get and I like the approach. There were four key endpoints. One was a metastasis-free survival, overall survival, time to prostate-specific antigen progression, and the first use of cytotoxic chemotherapy, which I think um, is a big thing for our patients. And so um, all um, aforementioned substances were included into this uh, network meta-analysis. And uh, um, as a result, um, it uh, showed that the encelotamide sh showed significant therapeutic benefits with regards to MFS, OS, TTCH, and TTP um, were better versus placebo and MFS um, compared to darolotamide and bicalotamide. Um, the study concluded that there was no significant differences among encelotamide and apalotamide which um, was uh, derived or was leading into the discussion um, on uh, side effect profile and efficacy. And uh, sure, we cannot compare trial trial uh, comparison. However, um, um, in the community, there's some discussion that uh, darolotamide uh, has, and we saw this uh, very good side effect profile, um, maybe um, not that efficacious than um, apalutamide and enzalutamide. And this was somehow proven um, with this uh, analysis, uh, this network uh, meta-analysis. And this was my interpretation on the data, which was felt out of the publication of the trial. Uh, would be curious to hear your, your thoughts on this uh, interesting approach, a statistical approach to use all the uh, four trials combined together. And as proven again, bicolutamide doesn't really have efficacy in this uh, situation and is uh, inferior to the novel hormone treatment agents described before. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I agree with your comments with, with a few caveats. I mean, I think, I think uh, certainly the, this is a good approach to make the best use of the data uh, because there is unlikely to be head-to-head -head trials, for example, of APA, ENZA, and DARO in, in, the, in the foreseeable future, at least not with these um, long-term clinically relevant endpoints like metastasis-free and overall survival. I'd say big picture, the, the analyses really kind of just serve to confirm the results of each of the independent trials. Um, you know, there's a large benefit for MFS and OS uh, in, for in favor over placebo in each of the three trials. And so my, my main takeaway is that um, it's, these three drugs are remarkably similar in their efficacy, particularly for the key endpoints of metastasis-free and overall survival. It is intriguing that they do sort of tease out this apparent um, claim of superiority of enzalutamide versus Darrow for time to PSA progression, but, but as we all know, that's sort of an intermediate endpoint and of, of less clinical significance. And then it, you know, obviously hands down ends as better than either placebo or bicalutamide, also consistent with the results of their previous published trial. So I'd say at a high level, um, I think my takeaway is that we that it's the strong treatment effect for each of the drugs and the consistency between the three trials that's important. So we really know that this, there's no question that there's benefit from early intervention in, in, the, in these high-risk non-metastatic CRPC patients. I could, I could only echo your, your uh, conclusion there. And as we've learned, and I was surprised uh, to see last year's ASCO um, um, publication, I think it was in a presentation by Neil Shore, on how um, metastatic CR, uh, MHSPC patients gets treated. 
and 60% still just receive ADT. And I suspect the same here in non-metastatic CRPC that a lot of men will just receive ADT. And I think knowing the OS and MFS benefit, I think uh, now in 2021, this is not enough anymore. And uh, according to most guidelines, NCCN I know for sure, and EAU also for sure with this data, this is a clear cut recommendation to use either one of them. I would be shy to just pick out one. Probably it's a Pepsi or Coke dis discussion, uh, which one you use, but uh, use one of them. I think it's, it's good. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah. The focus should be on intervention and the secondary consideration should be your preference of, of one drug over the other. Um, that does lead us to the, the third abstract that we plan to discuss, which is like in many ways, how do you choose between the, the agents and what other factors might inform your decision? Um, so this, this last abstract looked at the frequency management and resource use of AEs in non-metastatic CRPC and patients who are receiving apalutamide and enzalutamide. Uh, the, the title says a real world study. I, I mean, for full disclosure, I think I, we have to acknowledge that this was a Bayer sponsored um, abstract, um, the, the maker of darolutamide. And so they chose to look at AEs of the other two agents, um, which I'd say at a, you know, to be positive about it would be to try to identify potential areas of unmet need, um, particularly as they relate to tolerability. Um, so this was a retrospective chart review, included about 250 patients who'd either had APA or ENZA and who by, had at least one adverse event reported, um, and then looked at outcomes, including uh, median duration of follow-up, rates of discontinuation, rates of progression, and then um, the actions taken to address the AE. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about the results of this study. Well, thanks. Um, honestly, um, I needed some time when I first saw this presentation and I need to read it again. Um, real world data is always good. It's um, um, not that clear cut evidence, but still good and valuable. And um, therefore I was surprised by, uh, when looking at the table, how similar apalutamide and ensalutamide somehow um, has read out with regards to adverse events. So there wasn't a clear cut winner from my perspective, but I'm, I'm happy to hear your thoughts uh, on, on this presentation later on. And I think um, um, I, would have, I would have loved to have, as you said, uh, the bias substance darutamide also included, but this was probably due to approval status of, of the substance since it came into game a little bit later. And here the authors, I think, needs to be congratulated on their uh, chart review um, they conducted in, I think, 43 US sites. So this is really a big effort in identifying almost 700 non-metastatic CRPC patients, um, which out of them, um, 368 were treated with apalutamide and 333 ansalutamide. So here, I think it's a good approach. And I, I personally want to see the add-on darolutamide data, and I would urge the authors to somehow do the analysis again in the next couple of years and present the data for all three substances. Uh, meanwhile, I, I will stick with my saying that we have great substances now in this, uh, this indication, this new indication. Uh, I would urge um, the treating physicians to really think twice when or not to use PSMA PET, because in this situation, it doesn't help. For example, when you want to start with ENSA, and you do PSMA PET, detect metastasis, you can still do ENSA, but you can save the cost of PSMA PET or even non-availability. The same as for when you want to start with DARO or apalutamide, when it comes due to the imaging to MCRPC diagnosis, you cannot use the substances anymore, at least in the European uh, approval status. But happy to hear your thoughts, uh, Professor Smith, on, on this uh, last abstracts we are discussing today. Well, very well said, particularly on the, the points of clinical management and use of PSMA, P PSMA PET. We look forward to the time in the US where that'll become widely available. But I guess the, the one caveat would be the setting for which I could consider using it would be for someone who you were concerned about an isolated local recurrence if that issue had not already been addressed. And in a PSMA PET study um, that I'm sure you're quite familiar with, in a sort of a, a Spartan or Aramis-like population, um, the majority, nearly all the patients have detectable cancer by PSMA PET. Most have detectable metastatic disease that was not visible on conventional imaging, but a few have 
an isolated local recurrence. So that's something you'd want to identify in that patient who hasn't, say, for example, already had pelvic radiation or surgery and pelvic radiation. Um, that my takeaway from this um, real world study is co very consistent with what you said. And it's, it's remarkable, I'd say, how well aligned it is with the published data from Spartan and Prosper. Um, because the rates of treatment discontinuation that were reported due to AEs were eight and 12%, which is really remarkably similar to what was seen in the, in the clinical trials, in the phase three clinical trials. Um, uh, I wholeheartedly endorse your conclusion that we're fortunate to have three active agents in this setting. And again, the priority is gonna be to intervene early and then, um, and then a secondary really consideration is to choose between the available agents. Perfect. Well, well, thanks. Um, um, one, one question that um, we are getting asked frequently here in the German community, uh, what's next after progression on one of the novel substances in non-metastatic CRPC, for example, then you, you have ADT, you have, for example, apalutamide, and you detect PSA and uh, uh, imaging progression, and then you have per definition NCRPC. I would be very curious to hear your uh, next step here, whether it's another uh, novel hormone treatment or if it's, uh, for example, doxotaxil at this point. Do you have a clear recommendation or do you say, okay, depending on, for example, apalutamide, where we have the discussion on AR operations or not, um, you could still go with abiraterone as second line or you would straight away go into the doxotaxil chemotherapy or some other option like PARP, what we might have. Yeah, so our general preference is docetaxel or a clinical trial. For some patients, we'll consider the switch to Abby, uh, abiraterone acetate, um, although it's fair to say that the expected response rate and duration is relatively short with that maneuver. Yes. Thanks. This is uh, um, basically also what, uh, what we would do here. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, and from my side, um, it was uh, very pleasant to, to talk to you. Would be great to see each other again at one of the international conferences post pandemic i would say <laughs> so, pleasure speaking to you and uh, flat final final remarks for you thank you yeah so uh, so it was, it was great to speak with you as well and i share your view that we look we all look forward to the time when we can meet again in person take care be safe mm -hmm.